Hi, my name is Fabian Rupp. I'm a PhD student at Ulm University, and I will talk about the Liao inequality for the one-dimensional Wilmore energy, which is a joint work with Marius Müller from Freiburg. And I want to start by um, thanking Ho Ju Li for um, organizing this great event and for the opportunity to present some of my work here. Um, this video, um, this talk will consist of two videos. Um, in the first one, I want to give an introduction to the topic and um, motivate the results. Um, in the second one, I then want to state the main theorems and um, give a sketch of the proofs. So let's start as a motivation by uh, reviewing um, the situation in the case of the Wilmore energy of surfaces. Um, yeah. So for a closed surface sigma, here closed for me means it's um, compact, a compact two manifold without boundary, and an immersion F, a smooth immersion of sigma into Euclidean space Rd. Um, we can then um, define the associated geometric quantities. The first one being, of course, the pullback metric, which um, in local coordinates is just given by taking the um, Euclidean inner product um, of the um, partial derivatives of f. And uh, the second quantity is the, the second fundamental form, which is given by projecting the second order derivatives of f onto the normal um, space along the immersion. So we subtract the um, tangential part here. And then with this um, uh, second fundamental form, we can define the mean curvature vector by just taking its, its trace um, with respect to the metric. And for this mean curvature vector, we then define the, the Wilmore energy of the immersion um, to be 1 over 4 times, times the integral of um, the mean curvature squared integrated um, with respect to d mu, um, which is the, the Riemannian measure induced by the by the metric, so um, induced by the immersion. And this Wilmore energy is a very um, very interesting and very nice um, geometric functional. Um, one of its properties is that it's scaling invariant, so if I consider R times F instead of the immersion F, the energy does not, ch does not change. The second one is um, that it has an absolute minimizer namely the round sphere. So we always have um, that the energy is greater than or equal to 4 pi and the equality case is characterized and it's, it happens if and only if the, the image is a round sphere. So this means that um, the functional W is a, is a good way um, to measure um, bending um, of the immersion F. And one particular um, property of the Wilmer energy I want to highlight or, and speak about now is um, that it can detect self-intersections in the following sense. So if our um, immersion has a self-intersection, in other words, a point which is um, a point in Rd which is covered twice by the immersion, then the Wilmer energy is at least for um, 8 pi, which is twice the amount of the, of the um, round sphere. And this is a consequence of the um, celebrated Liao inequality. And uh, here, here I have a picture of such a, an immersion with a self-intersection. So um, you, can, you can see, because it's, it's transparent here, from the bottom and from the top, um, these two parts, they intersect at precisely one point, which is uh, roughly here. And this means that this, this, this shape actually has to have at least 8 pi. Um, as its Wilmer energy. And what I want to discuss now is um, um, whether analogous results for curves are true, uh, to what extent. So let's quickly review the, the geometry of, of curves in the plane. Um, for today, a curve um, will just be a smooth map, gamma from the um, circle S1 into Rd, which has nowhere um, vanishing derivative, so it's an immersion. 
And to such a, a curve, we can associate the, the arc length derivative, which is given by um, the ordinary derivative dx. And then we, we um, normalize and divide by the length of the velocity of gamma, which is always assumed to be uh, non-zero. And um, with this um, notation, the unit tangent along the curve gamma is just given by ds gamma. And uh, we have also have the arc length um, element, which is which is um, given by by this formula here. Okay, um, two more things we have for the uh, setting of curves. So um, um, we have the curvature vector, which is given by um, um, the second order derivative of the curve gamma. This is always normal to the curve, so it's orthogonal to the tangent. And in, in dimension two, this means that it's parallel um, um, to the unique normal, and we can define a unique normal by um, rotation, by a rotation of the of the unit tangent by pi over two counterclockwise. Right? So you take the tangent vector and you rotate it. Um, and that way you end up with a unit normal along the curve. And with respect to this unit normal, you can then define a, a scalar notion of curvature, which I call the sine curvature or just curvature, which is given by the inner product of the curvature vector and this um, normal. normal. Yeah. Um, okay, so of course, it's not entirely obvious what the natural notion or version of the Wilmore energy for, for curves, even in the plane, um, should be. And actually, I want to uh, give you two candidates for this, um, for a generalized notion of Wilmore energy. And we will later discuss in which sense this embeddedness um, detect, uh, in self intersection detection um, can work for these energies. So the first one um, I want to introduce is the total curvature, which is just given by the integral of uh, the um, length of the curvature vector integrated with respect to the arc length element. And this is a very, um, very um, well studied energy, I would say. There are multiple nice results about this um, quantity. And the first one being Fenchel's theorem which says that this um, total curvature kappa is always greater than or equal to 2 pi. And in the equality case, we have uh, that gamma is a planar curve, it's convex, and it's also embedded. So um, the minimal shape, the optimal shape of a curve um, with respect to the energy k is an embedded one. And this is kind of good because this is similar to what we had for the Wilmore energy where the optimal shape was a round sphere. Another very good quantity for, for um, extending this um, result, the Liao result, is that kappa is uh, k is scaling invariant. So um, if we take r times the curve, then it has the same total curvature energy. Because you get a factor um, 1 over r from the curvature, and you get a factor of r from the arc length element. So this cancels out, and it's scaling invariant. Um, even more, um, we have the fari milner theorem, which gives a nice topological interpretation to this energy. Namely, if we have a knotted curve in um, R3, then the total curvature has to be at least um, no, strictly bigger than 4 pi. So this seems to be kind of a good candidate. However, there's one downside, namely if we want to work with variational methods, Mm, this is a bad energy in the sense that since we raise the um, curvature to the power 1 here, um, the natural energy space is given by W to 1, and this is not a reflexive space. So it's very um, inconvenient for variational methods, let's say. This is maybe um, a motivation to introduce another um, candidate, namely the elastic energy, which is defined in a similar fashion, but now we take the integral where we raise the length of the curvature ve vector to the power 2, right? So this is the elastic energy. 
And this is a very classical energy to, to measure the bending of, uh, of a curve, which was um, already studied by Euler and Bernoulli in the, in the 18th century, um, and which is um, used in elasticity theory, for instance. The downside, or one downside, of this energy is that it's no longer scaling invariant, because now we have kappa to the power of 2, so the two um, factors of R don't cancel out as they did before. But the good thing about this energy is that because we raise kappa to the power 2, the energy is much better for variational methods, because now we can work in the Hilbert space, W22, which of course is much, much, much nicer. Um, right. So, of course, one can also speak about the critical points of such energies. And for this um, elastic energy, because it's um, scaling invariant, um, one um, discusses usually a, a slightly larger class of, um, of um, critical points, namely critical points for the penalized functional e, e plus lambda L, where L is the, the uh, length of the, of the curve. And critical points for this energy are then called um, lambda elastica. And um, yeah, they are um, very interesting um, objects and we will, we will see how they look um, soon. So I will um, now give a brief introduction to the relevant, relevant results um, um, in the theory of elastic curves, but this is um, by no means uh, complete, so I just want to uh, quickly highlight the, the things that we will use later on. So the first thing, what is this um, famous equation, this elastica equation, how can we characterize the lambda elastica? And um, one can compute that being an, uh, a lambda elastica means that this um, Euler-Lagrange equation here has to be satisfied. So um, for some lambda in R, if it's, if it's satisfied for some lambda in R, I say that it's an elastica. If I want to specify the lambda, I would say it's a lambda elastica. But um, anyway, this is a second order um, ordinary differential equation in terms of kappa, which makes it then a fourth order um, ODE in terms of gamma which will look rather, rather difficult and very complicated. Um, fortunately, this equation can be, can be solved exp explicitly. Um, I think this was first done by um, Salschütz, but uh, today we will discuss a, a more recent approach by, by Langer and Singer. And um, yeah, so, so how, can we, how can we solve this equation or why can we explicitly solve it? It's, it's not clear a priori. So what's the idea? We take, um, we assume that we have a solution, and now what we do is we test this equation with um, ds kappa. So here we multiply with ds kappa, and then we integrate, right? And what we end up with then is that we have that this quantity here on the left uh, is constant. Right? Then we have kappa cubed times um, ds kappa. This is just the derivative of that guy. And on the last part, this is also works um, perfectly well. So we have this um, constant um, quantity here. Now we multiply with 4 times kappa squared. And we end up with um, this equation here. And now you may observe that this guy over here, this is just ds of kappa squared, squared, right? Yes. So if we now make a substitution and call kappa squared u, the equation just becomes ds u squared is equal to this third order polynomial in terms of u over here. And um, one can then show that this can, can be solved um, explicitly for u in terms of elliptic functions. Well, kind of explicit. And uh, then we have the u, which determines the, the curvature kappa. And from that, we, we can find the curves gamma again by um, the fundamental theorem of curves, if you want. 
So this is why this um, equation can be solved explicitly. And what one ends up with is then the following set of elastica. I just um, wrote down the, how the curvatures may look like. So if we have an elastica of a not necessarily closed curve, then um, one has one of the four cases. The first one is that um, kappa is a constant, in which case we end up with either a circle or a straight line. And then there are these cases two, three, and four, where the um, the curvature can be can be written in terms of an elliptic function. So, for instance, for case two, we have the elliptic cosine here, and we have some parameters um, alpha, m, and s naught running around. Um, yeah, and then we have these um, three three types of elastica. So the the second um, the second guy is called a wave-like elastica, the, the third one is orbit-like, and the last one is borderline elastica, which you will um, see in a second why this um, name is justified. Um, don't worry, you, you don't have to rem remember the formulas. It's just uh, to, to, to give you an idea how, these, how this equation can actually be solved explicitly. But what I want to do now is I want to um, look at the, at the visualization of how these curves then look like um, if one integrates the, the curvature. So let's start with the case of wave-like elastica. Um, and I've plotted several of those for, for increasing values of m between 0 and 1. So if m is close to 0, then we just have here such a wave function. Um, so this is this is because the, the curvature involves the elliptic cosine, which behaves like the cosine in some sense. And as now m slowly increases towards this second picture, what we guess what we get is that we get um, more curves. So it curves more, and it becomes more bumpy. And as m further increases, the bumps suddenly start to overlap. So at first they touch and then they overlap. And as m increases even further, there will be one specific value of m where suddenly all these bumps overlap in precisely um, one, one to give to give precisely precisely one curve if you want, or yeah, one one shape, um, which is this um, figure eight shape on the bottom left down here, and this is. Um, um, very important for, for later because we know that this actually defines a closed curve now. And here the, so here the value of m is uh, approximately um, 0 0.83 and this is called uh, the figure 8 elastica. Okay, if one then increases the m even further, these two um, drops that form the figure 8 elastica they um, start to, to um, open up and drift away from each other. This is what you can see here in the second picture. And if m finally um, reaches 1, one um, is left with um, exactly one drop or, or one loop. And um, this is what is called now the borderline elastica. And why this is the borderline elastica, you can see if you plot the, um, the orbit-like elastica now because they start for m equal to 0 exactly, uh, sorry, for m equal to 1 um, exactly with um, the borderline elastica. So the borderline elastica lies exactly in between the wave-like and the orbit-like elastica. Right, so what happens now if I further decrease the m in the, in the orbit-like uh, orbit -like case, um, then, well, the loops will form far away from the origin for, for um, m close to 1, right? But, but um, as m decreases, they will approach this loop in the middle here, as you can see in the second picture. And well, if you decrease m even further, then they will at some point start to overlap and overlap more, overlap even more, and eventually what this picture does not exactly say, but what what you can already imagine, um, these um, these uh, loops overlap so much that eventually, or in the limit, as m goes to zero, 
um, they will converge to a, to a circle um, in some sense. And this is then also an elastica. So kind of um, the orbit-like elastica are uh, interpolating between the borderline elastica and, and the circle. Right, so this is, this is the, the case of the orbit-like elastica, how they look like. So in particular, what you saw, what we saw now is that there is really only one of these curves which was closed, namely the figure 8 elastica. And um, this can be summarized in the following theorem. So here, this is the definition of the figure 8 elastica, if you want. Um, and the theorem says that there's precisely two kinds of elastica in, in R2. One is the, the circle, and the other one is this figure 8 elastica. Or, of course, what you can do is you can take multiple coverings of those. And what you can also do is you can um, um, move them, you can tr translate them, you can rotate them, um, you can rescale them, and of course you can also reparameterize them, but up to these um, invariances, those, those two types are the only um, elasticae, closed elasticae in uh, R2. And this follows from the, from the results of um, Langer and Singer. Okay, and then this is a good time for a little break and we will resume with the main results in the second video.